92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com. We're streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5. And we'll have audio and soon-to-be video on RTC Channel 4. Hey, Libby, how you doing? I'm doing good. All right, welcome to the studio. Also, welcome to the studio, John Alley. He's the president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for pleasure. joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, really? Absolutely. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah, this highlighted my month no, when I get to come good. down here. Yes. Well, and not everybody comes and says that, so I'm Ooh, glad. I'm glad do I need you... to talk to anybody or anything? <laughs> I'll give you a list. Okay. <laughs> Trustees were meeting yesterday. Yes, at our board meeting yesterday. Uh, you know, couple items came up uh, from a capital expenditure as we we're looking you know replacing equipment and we we try to keep the stuff updated as modern as we can get uh, Becky Kopka who's a director of our surgical services came in and we're in the process now of switching out the uh, surgery carts or the beds if you come into surgery and the ones we have now are, are pneumatic so when you lift them you have to pump them up well, over time that wears out so now it's kind of a bumpy ride on some of these carts so we did authorize board yesterday start the replacement process we're going to get two electric carts in so that's going to be much smoother so you're not getting that jolt as you're going up and down in that bed then also rick dennis who's the director of our cardiopulmonary services we need some bipaps which is uh, aids for breathing so if you come in a lot of people have like a cpap unit at home this is more the industrial version that you would have in the hospital. So the board did authorize two uh, new BiPAP machines. And one new technology is called VapoTherm. And you've got my full knowledge on it right there. <laughs> uh, but it's an upgrade from the BiPAP. So it's supposed to be a little okay. better, some new technology. So we decided let's get one and try it. Let's see how it goes. And then as it comes time to replace the BiPAPs we have, then we might move you know, in the future to more of the, the VapoTherms. But... Uh, you know, he, he used all that technical stuff, and everybody shook their head and said, is that what we need? And they said, yes. So, uh, you know, we're getting some of this, uh, some of the medical equipment is very technical. So we have to rely on the expertise of right. those directors and the staff to say, here's what it does, and here's why we need it. Sure. And so the board did approve that. The next, it probably took the majority of the board meeting time. Uh, we had Monty Hoover come in from BSA Life Structures, which is an architectural firm in Indianapolis. About three, four, five years ago, we looked at uh, the remodeling of the second floor patient rooms. And at that time, you know, financially, we just weren't in that position where I felt comfortable to move forward with it. Well, now we, we've kind of got some money, you know, kind of put away in that rainy day fund. So we kind of dusted those plans off and had money come back in. And we're looking at what it's going to take to, you know, remodel the patient rooms. Virtually nothing's been done to those rooms since 1979 when they were uh, built new served us well mm -hmm. they, they're, they're very good for 1979 technology sure. but what we're seeing now is we're seeing patients you know one staying shorter but they're much sicker when they're in there so in that room is far more equipment than ever was dreamed of back in 1979 so it kind of makes the room a little cluttered a little you know there's got to be a better way to do it so we're looking at how can we maybe increase some of the square footage in the rooms and, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we had a room stretcher where we could just stretch the rooms, but, uh, you know, that doesn't work. So, looking at quite a few options, so very preliminary in this. We, we kind of know what can we do, what kind of time frame are you looking at, and just a ballpark, what's the dollar amount, you know, to do this. So, it's going to be, you know, not a cheap endeavor to do those rooms. Uh, we can only take so many rooms out of service at a time. So it's probably anywhere from 18 to, to 24 month process from the point we start till we have the rooms renovated. And that's if we just do minor renovation. Uh, one of the thoughts was, you know, right now we have 25 rooms. Are we using all 25? So can we take four rooms and make them into three, make them a little bigger? So again, those are all the options that we're trying to go through. You know, once we start taking walls out and putting new walls in, of course, the cost goes up. So we do have a budget we're trying to stay within. Again, I want to do this with cash. I don't want to have to do any, you know, debt on this project. So, you know, we got to mind here, here's the resources we have to use. What can we get for that? So we did kind of give Monty some ideas. He's looking back next board meeting, some updates. One of the things we're really looking at is the heating and cooling for those rooms. Exactly. What's the best technology for that? You know, one of the proposals was called a four-pipe unit, which basically means we run four new pipes from the boiler room through the whole hospital to these rooms. Is that the best method? Uh, fairly costly. Can we get the same results with a, maybe a, a 
better technology, maybe a, a little more cost-efficient method. So they're going to bring an engineer up, and that's going to be one of the major discussions. How can we heat and cool these rooms? And we'd like to have it so each room can be individually controlled. Right now, it's kind of a group control because of the technology that was in the room in 1979. So we know that gives some patients, you know, somebody's cold, somebody's hot. And, and we have a hard time individually per room making that comfortable and we're aware of that and we do the best we can but we're limited by what we have to work with so kind of an exciting process as we start looking at what are we going to do what's it going to take um met with all the leadership of the hospital this morning and, and told them i'm going to need your staff members to help on this this isn't something that you want administration to do we're not in those rooms every day we're not the the caregiver so you know we've asked for a team of nursing physical therapy respiratory therapy all those folks that spend time in those patient rooms i need a team of your folks to sit down with the architect say this will work or this won't work so again we want to do when we're going to do it do it right one of the other issues is you know how do we plan for where those that we're going to be 20 years from now or 15 years from now over time we've seen you know, the, the hospital inpatient is a is dying. We're just not seeing those patients because of technology. Do we need, again, 25 rooms? Well, that's the question, sure. Yeah, so, you know, the we, I'm kind of looking at Aaron. The board looked at me, and I said, the crystal ball's blank on this one. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. So, I mean, that's going to be the hard part. Where is tech? Have we kind of maxed out on that technology? So who we're seeing now as far as patient loads is what we're going to see. Or is there going to be some major innovations that come in where now you're, Expect being in the hospital, you're going to do it at home. And right. there, there is a pilot program now. It was done in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York where you don't come into the hospital. You stay home. Oh, wow. And the hospital sends nurses and staff there. So you get your IV therapy at home. The nurse comes to your home. Everything's done in your home. And it was a project, you know, uh, funded by uh, Medicare to see is that a lower cost alternative. And the preliminary results says they saw a quicker recovery time for those folks outside the hospital in their home so is that going to be coming so again a lot of things that we we got to try to you know predict guess for lack of a better term where are we going to be 10 15 20 years from now so you know that's all has to go into this process so as you can imagine it, it's going to be some time i think before we, we ever start anything right now my projection is but if we do anything it's probably be fourth quarter uh, 2019 okay. so you know we're a year and a half away from really do anything but i think that's the right thing to do i do not want to spend dollars that are wasted you know, we got to spend our money wisely get what we need for our hospital in this community so as we move forward in the next you know 10 15 years we're good we don't have to say oh gosh wish we had done that so it's kind of exciting it's a lot of work sure. uh, it's scary at the same time that you know are you going to make a mistake what are we going to do with this so uh the board's got a pretty good challenge in this and so does the staff because again this is going to be a group effort with all of us you know we'll probably even have some focus groups maybe with the community who's used the facility what did you like what didn't you like right. about your stay here because that needs to be factored into that process also we've got to make a room that not always functional for staff but for patients and family and and right now it gets crowded in there sometimes we have to ask a family member can you step out while we do this because of the room so we're taking all of that into consideration as we look forward and move forward to this project and uh hopefully by you know this time okay. next year we have a little more direction right. and uh can say okay we're going to start here and two years from now we'll have all the rooms right because you just do a few at a time we can only do you know right, right now our plan is do mostly three room increments so they would have to be started completely finished before we move move okay. to the next three rooms is that going to increase our costs slightly? But but I can't take the, all the yeah. rooms out of service. So we know that's going to add a little bit of a premium to that construction, but it's the right thing to do so we can make sure we have space available for patients who need to come into the facility. So, uh, again, it's it's exciting, but it's scary at the same time. And, you know, most everybody in healthcare, once they've gone through a major construction like we did with our, our addition a few years ago, say, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> never doing this again. Well, we're going to do it again. Famous so, last words. Famous last yeah, words. Right. We, we all, you know, we got to improve it. We got to make sure we keep the infrastructure of the building current so we meet the needs of staff and patients and physicians and so hopefully this is that next step to bring us back really comfortable for everybody sure. the rooms are still functional but they can be better and that's what we got to look for what is the next uh, generation of patient rooms that we need to look at okay and then we finally got into fi financials okay. at that point but that uh, as you can imagine that was a fairly long sure discussion a right. uh, very good discussion some of the board had very good you know questions for you know for the architect and he says i'll have to get back with you because we right. hadn't thought of that so you know i'm liking 
our process. We're just not having an architect come and say, here's what you get, we'll build it, and we're done. That doesn't work. We, right. we need to have a lot of customization to that. Uh, for the month of May, we had gross revenue of about $11.8 million. Our deductions, our famous deductions, about $7.6 <laughs> million. Uh, then it had operating expenses of $4.8 million. It had some non-operating revenue, which is basically anything that's not direct patient-related that we you know comes into the hospital of two hundred ninety-eight thousand. So even with all that, we still had a net loss of about two hundred thirty-two thousand for the month. Um, year to date, we're still at a loss, but okay. you know, as you're aware, summer months we lose it and we start picking back up. So our goal is by the time we hit December, we're back on the positive side and, and uh, hoping to have you know four to five hundred thousand dollar profit by the end of the year from operations. Uh, you know, again, it's all based on volumes. So, sure. you know, sure. we're doing an excellent job. We went through all of our expenses this morning uh, with our leadership group and our budget expenses. We're right on target. Okay. Exactly where we want to be, what we predicted. But what we can't predict is that revenue. We don't know, you know, what kind of illness we're going to see, who's going to be sick. And, you know, again, I've said many times, our goal is to put ourselves out of business to <laughs> keep a healthy community. Right. So if you're healthy, you don't need us. Right. Uh, but we're there if you do need us. So that's the fine balance. How do we meet the needs of the community and still try to maintain a, a positive bottom line because all the dollars that's generated in the hospital doesn't go to shareholders. It doesn't go to anybody. It goes right back into the hospital for infrastructure, much like the room expansion. We've been saving money over the past five years, setting it aside so we can do this project. So it's, a, it's important that we generate a positive bottom line, but you know it doesn't need to be obnoxious. So okay. we, we want to make sure we'd like to have one to 2% bottom line. You know, To me, that's what we should do that allows us for that reinvestment into the organization. John Alley's president and CEO, Woodlawn Hospital. Did that pretty well take care of the meeting? That was pretty okay. well the meeting. It uh, was fun. It was an interesting meeting. <laughs> you started off today talking about equipment and uh, some different changes you're going to make, some things you're going to try. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult for small hospitals like Woodlawn to keep up with all the equipment technology changes that happen in medical care on a regular basis? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's changes daily. So our goal is, you know, we don't want to be behind the eight ball, but we don't want to be that, that first person to try something new. So when we're evaluating equipment, one, it has to meet our needs. You know, there is, is tons of devices we could buy that we would probably never use. It looks nice and it sounds fancy, but, you know, it's a waste of money. So what we really make our all the directors do, they do a lot of preemptive homework when we get ready to replace a piece of equipment. And, uh, you know, it has to meet our needs. It, it doesn't need to be the latest, the greatest, the, you know, the best on the block. It needs to meet our needs and fit it within our financial scope. So, you know, we take a lot of time. Usually when somebody comes and says, I need to replace X, Y, Z, it could be two months before that gets through that process because we want to make sure if we're spending those dollars, we're spending it wisely. And, and as you, it's much like a car. You know, you can sure. spend sure. whatever you want on a car. Uh, do you need the Lamborghini? To go back and forth to work, <laughs> no. But you need something reliable and dependable. So that's what we try to do is make sure we're getting you know, that dependable, reliable piece of equipment that meets patient needs. And we get a lot of physician input, too. Some of these things we'll trial. We'll bring in, a, especially in surgery, different type of instruments. We'll have the company say, we want to try one. So they'll bring a unit in. Maybe we'll have it a month. Let all the surgeons use that. And we get the feedback, well, I don't like this. Then we'll try another one. So there might be five different vendors that will come in with their equipment, want us to trial it. We let the physician use it. And they say, you know, of those five, I like these two the best. So now we narrow our search down and start working with those two vendors. So it's a long process. It, uh, and, but I think how we have it set up within our organization, we spend the dollars very wisely. We're not wasting money on unnecessary items or you know, bells and whistles. Sometimes you, you like again, right. a car. Exactly. You can get whatever you want on it, but if you don't ever use it, why get it? Why so have that, it? So sure. why have it? So that's kind sure. of a, our philosophy as we're looking at this. When we get stuff, it's good stuff, but it might not be, you know, the bells and whistles, which is something you use once every year. Don't need that. I want something that's functional. that meets our needs today. Woodlawn, pretty good shape physician-wise, John? We're, we're looking right now. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we do have a search going for a surgeon. Um, uh, Always looking for family practice docs because, you know, I'm recruiting for five years from now. Exactly. Because I know some of my physicians are going to be retiring. So, I, you know, we're always looking for that. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a never-ending process, I think, looking for physicians. Had, a, you know, a few good candidates for surgery. Once you really talk to them, uh, you know, the, the interesting part, I, we talked to one who wanted to come to a rural setting. And I learned years ago, I need your definition of rule. <laughs> and to come find out, uh, they, they were from, uh, you know, New York City. Right. 
their definition of rural would probably be Fort Wayne or Indianapolis. Right. Uh, so, you know, once I kind of explained that to them, they go, oh, well, that's not what we thought. And I said, I'd rather we find that out right, now right than to waste both sure. our time. Sure. So, uh, you know, you, you got to kind of listen to what they say and then ask them their definition of right. some of that. Uh, we do have another candidate uh, that we're going to be talking to, hopefully within the next week or so, so we can, you know, get our surgical staff, uh, surgeons back up to the two, which is for our facility is what we need. Okay. It fits our needs perfectly. You know, neither surgeons overwork. They get some time off to refresh and recharge. Uh, it's much, much like anything else. They're a very stressful job. They need a break. Right. They, they got to be able to sit down, relax, and just kind of, I say, let your brain go flatline. So, you know, to, to recharge the batteries. One of those posi- uh, positions where you shouldn't make very many mistakes. You can't make any you mistakes. You can't make any mistakes. You can't That's make right. any mistakes. So <laughs> I want to make sure they're fresh and, and sure. rested. And, uh, you know, so with a complement of two, that gives us that opportunity to, to share the surgery between the two so we don't have one person working 10, 12, 13 hours a day doing surgeries. And Last question, John. Uh, several years ago, Woodland Hospital took over Fulton County Medical Clinic. Uh, has that process now, I'm sure that's all been completed, but is it going well? It's Are going you satisfied? well, yes. Okay. I, I'm very satisfied with that. Um, you know, it, it was an honor to be able to work with Dr. Hoff prior to him retiring. Um, and, we, you know, we still have Dr. Bugno and Dr. Brubaker, a valuable por- uh, part of our hospital staff. And I think, you know, that the two cultures, was it rocky at, fr- at first? Yes, because when you're coming from an independent physician practice into a hospital owned, we have rules, right. you know, and they're different than what you have in, a, in an independent practice. So I think it took a while, you know, to get that culture to change. To, well, I know you've always done it, but you can't do it that way now. And I, I think they've melded into our culture just fine. Uh, absolute outstanding addition to to our complement of physicians in the community. Working very, very well. Very pleased with how that has all come together over the past few years. Okay. Take a look at next month's meeting, John. Probably uh, a lot of these same things will continue on. I think we're going to do a lot of the same things. By having BSA coming back in, I think we're going to get a little deeper into the weeds, maybe into the, the infrastructure of this project. You know, from the logistics, how do you do this? And how can we... You know, if we're going to go with the, that four-pipe heating and cooling system, how does that affect the rest of the hospital? What do we need to shut down? Because, you know, that's stuff we need to plan years in advance if we're going to have to shut part of the system down. We just can't come in and say, oh, tonight we're shutting it down because, you know, it feeds so many different parts of the hospital. So, again, that planning needs to start now if we're thinking a year and a half from now to do that project. Still catching fish in the pond. They're still fishing in the <laughs> pond. Yes, uh, you know, to, if there's been. You can tell when there's a busy weekend on the lake because there's it, the pond's kind of frothy. But uh, a couple of days, it usually clears right up. John Alley, President, CEO, of Woodlawn Hospital. As always, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. We know our listeners. Oh, I love too. coming down here. Thanks for having Thank me, you, John.